Seals are more complex creatures than what meets the eye. Following a difficult past of exploitation, the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 was enacted to help seals, whales, dolphins, and porpoises recover. Today, some populations are beginning to resume their natural roles in coastal ecosystems, while others continue to struggle in our modern world. The Atlantic Ocean is changing, and there are still many questions left to answer about these iconic animals. What threats do these animals continue to face in our modern world? How big is their habitat, and do they stay in the same place all year? Are the seals that we see in Maine the same animals that we find off of New York? When and where do these animals come to shore, and why? To answer these questions, organizations up and down the East Coast are working together to respond to live and dead seals, rehabilitate sick and injured animals, and research their post-release lives. Seals are an indicator species that can help us understand more about the health of our world ocean. Join us for the story of one harbor seal, number 87, as we explain this process from start to finish. And it all starts with you, the public. So this animal, number 87, was reported at Genes State Beach, which is right here in Rye, New Hampshire. Um, it was actually reported by a jogger. For both live and dead marine mammals, we collect what we call level A um, or morphometric data. So basically what that is, is anything from the date and the location that the animal is in, but also the species, the age class, um, a host of different measurements. But then we also get down into samples that we take. Um, so in this animal, we took what we call swab samples. We also took serum from its blood. We send those samples out, but we also archive some of the samples, meaning that we deep freeze them. So in the future, if anyone needs them, we have them ready. Those swab samples are screened for anything from influenza, um, also focine distemper virus, but also now as we live through a pandemic, um, coronavirus or COVID is starting to be looked at in some of these animals and can they host the virus? So it's not an easy decision to pick up an animal, take it out of its natural environment, and bring it somewhere foreign to it. Uh, so there's a number of parameters we look for in an animal. We can't pick all of them up. We're not meant to save every animal. Um, but for those animals that are out there suffering and there's something we can do, that's why we're in place. Most concerning for us was the swelling of the muzzle. Um, so on the left side of the animal's face, from the eye right to the nostril, was very swollen. But the concerning thing was that the animal couldn't close its nostril all the way. And the reason that's concerning is they need to be able to seal that off to dive. So for that reason, we picked the animal up to do a full hands-on health assessment. Um, and in the case of this animal, it was clear that it needed to go to rehabilitation. So 87 was suffering from pneumonia, had a really banged up face and muzzle area, was swell, swollen, and um, I was underweight. First of all, we bring in the animal, we do diagnostics on the animal to review what's, you know, is there something bacterial or viral going on? And then we started on nebulizer treatments. So we give kind of fluid therapy at first, so we don't even offer food or nutrition for that first 24 to 48 hours. And then we did some wound care as well for that muzzle, so we don't want that to get infected and hurt more of what he has going on. Um, so once we get through that fluid therapy, we do another blood diagnostic recheck in 48 hours, see how he's handling that, and then start to introduce nutrition from there. I couldn't believe for him, I was feeding him on a daily basis what I usually feed like a juvenile harp seal. So he was handling it too. The more we kind of offered him, the more he was taking it on. So he just was a whippersnapper around that. We actually offer live fish to all rehab uh, animals before release just to make sure that they know how to capture live prey and they're successful. So they have a checklist of what they need to do before they can leave our center. He just needed a little bit more weight to gain. He had checked off all the other things on his list and he surpassed his goal. We had a goal of 25 kgs for him um, due to his kind of size and length in general and he was 26 kgs so he had a little extra to leave. Especially during the winter months when the water temperature is a little colder, we want to make sure that they have a little extra pounds when they're headed back out into wild. We're, we're often asked why why do we go through all this efforts to either re rehabilitate an animal or go out and do wild studies and why do we put these satellite tags on? Why are we out here on a cold day and why do we think it's important? 
Um, and it comes from a, a couple of different levels. One is we really don't know as much as people think about these animals. We, you know, we see seals here and we'll see them hold out on rocks um, where they're sunning themselves, but are they the same seals that you see? How, does that, how do these populations change and how do they mix? Is an animal more likely to stay up here in Maine uh, during the winter or during the summer or does it move to New York or does it move anywhere else or does it move to Canada? And what we're finding is, is that these animals move great distances. When we talk about marine mammals, you see a very small fraction. So working together with our partners, Seco Science Center, Marine Mammals of Maine, Atlantic Marine Conservation Society, um, we have to pull these data to try and get a better understanding of what, what these animals are doing and how we can better help them. So the tag looks exactly like this right here, and this is a satellite tag. And what it does is it has these two saltwater switches that you can see here. And so we put this on the back of the seal and we attach it to the fur with uh, a five minute epoxy. So what that does is it, it attaches just like when you get paint in your hair, eventually it'll come off. So by the time the animals molt again, the tag will fall off. But during the time that it's on the back of the animal, wherever the animal goes, tag will go and when it comes to the surface it'll send a signal out to a satellite that's passing overhead uh, it'll receive the signal and by getting multiple positions then it will get an idea of where the animal is what makes these tags interesting is that they also collect temperature data as well as haul out statistics well we're often asked when we're tagging does, does the tagging bother them or does the process bother them it's definitely going to be something that the animals are going to notice when we put the epoxy on it's a two-part epoxy it has an exothermic reaction which does give off some heat but you can hold it in your hand and it doesn't really bother you that much i have seen animals when we first put the tag on that maybe they roll around a little bit but after that i mean it, i don't really see any uh any real adverse changes in what, what I would say is their behavior as far as, well, they don't swim, they don't do whatever. Just like for me, and I'll use it, I'll compare it. I forget I have a beard, you know, but when I first started growing one, I was like, hey, look at this, right? But you, I mean, you get used to that and the, these animals get used to it in the same way. Um, and then keep in mind, the tag will come off usually the next time they molt. Our tags are probably about 130 grams, which is a lot compared to the fact that you can use a similar tag and put it on a bird and it weigh, weigh a couple of grams. But our tags have to go down to 100, 200, 500 meters. So they have to be able to go down to great depths and have great pressure. Um, there also happen to be an electronic piece of equipment that you put in salt water. So there is a potential for something to fail, even though they're made not to have that happen. If the animal goes out right away, and we don't really get any hits in it. I look at it and say, well, maybe that's operator error, you know, in the sense the tag came off, the fur didn't really hold the tag. If the animal's out there for a while and it's and it's doing what we consider normal behavior and then it abruptly disappears, um, then you wonder, hey, did something else happen? Did it get, get in, in, entangled? Did it get caught in a fishery? Did it something else, you know, un, unusual occur? And, th and those things do happen. Uh, and then you think about, okay, after you go beyond 30 days and 60 days, then the seal or, or whatever animal you're tagging is behaving like they should and so they have natural threats that are out there. Um, we're often asked what happens if a shark eats it, will you get um, the data from the tag? Um, but you have to take a step back and realize that the tag is only going to signal when it's on the surface. And the reason for that is the salt water switches that we talked about actually short the tag out when it's underwater. So once it comes to the surface, so as long as it's going to be wet and, and, in, and inside a shark, it's not going to, you're not going to notice it. If the tag stays on the bottom of the ocean, you're not going to notice it. But many years ago, I had a tag that actually must have fallen off an animal. And like four or five years later, it was brought up in a dragger and the, the tag started signaling right away. So, you know, it's, it's never over until it's over. The release of Harbor Seal number 87 is really just the beginning of the rest of his life. Follow along with us to watch this brave little seal's journey around the big blue ocean. Who knows where he'll end up next?